Okay. Good, good. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the last presentation of today. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Peter Sjöland. Now, Peter is one of the founders of the Swedish Society of Genetic Genealogy and comes to us all the way from Sweden. He is a professional genetic genealogist who runs a company providing training, presentations and consultancy for genealogists and genealogical societies. He's also an author and has written a handbook book, uh, in genetic genealogy and a popular science book on the peopling of Sweden spanning the last 11,000 years. And is that published or due to be published shortly? Two weeks. Two weeks <laughs> and you will pick up Peter's book on the populating population of, or the peopling of Sweden over the last 11,000 years, some of which you will hear in uh, Peter's uh, presentation, which is uh, addressing a very, very common question in Ireland. Am I a Viking? Do I have Viking DNA? And if I do, where did it come from? So to uh, give us all the answers to our uh, fervent questions, please give a big welcome to Peter Schoenland. Thank you, Maurice. Well, it's really... Nice to be back in Ireland. Actually, I haven't been here yet, but my long-lost cousins were here a <laughs> <thousand> years ago. <laughs> She's like, I'm coming home a bit. Uh, yeah, that's true. The question we get the most in the Swedish DNA project is, is this Viking DNA? And the second most common question is, is this Sami DNA? That's the two most common questions we get in Sweden. But I'm leaving the Sami out for today. And speaking about Vikings. So first, some details on how we work with genetic genealogy in Sweden. I tested 2011. It seems like centuries ago. Because then we were a couple of hundred tested in Sweden. Since then, it's skyrocketing. We are now close to 20,000 tested people in Sweden. That's two out of a thousand in our population. <laughs> so it's really nice to do a genetic genealogy in Sweden right now. And uh, it looks like this when it comes to which companies we're using in, in Scandinavia. It's very, very heavy bias on family tree DNA because they have the largest database by far with Scandinavians. So that's the company we're using. And we are quite heavily into Y DNA and mitochondria DNA. I think we're a lot more into mitochondria DNA than many other, other countries. That could be because we have very, very good records in Sweden. Sweden is one of the paradises of genealogy in the world because we have church records that start in the 1680s. Wow. And they are almost intact for all the parishes in all the country. Before that, they have tax records, they have court records going back all the way to 1535. So, you are a bit spoiled. I can hear that when I listen to you. That they have burnt the records and you don't yeah. come so far back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that means we can trace our ancestry a long way back in the records, and then we can also use mitochondrial DNA and Y DNA in a very good fashion. One other thing to remember when we're talking about <coughs> Scandinavian genealogy we don't do surnames. <laughs> That's very different from this part of the world. The last 150 years we have had surnames that have been inherited in Scandinavia. But before that, we didn't have surnames. We had patronymics. So, children to Olaf and Anna, in this case, Britta and Nils, would be called Britta Olof's daughter. Olof's daughter. Or Nils Olofsson. Nils Olof's son. And his children would be called, like, Anna, Nils' daughter. Nils. Or Anders Nilsson. So that's totally different from following surnames and Y-DNA. I'm going to start there. You know, Scandinavians, <laughs> they have always been a cool people. <laughs> <laughs> 15,000 years ago, we were very cool, very cool covered by 3,000 meters of ice. 
And obviously, no one lived in Scandinavia then. But uh, eventually, the ice retracted. And then there were people out in Europe that were hunter-gatherers. And they started people in Sweden for 11,000 years ago. And they came over Denmark. Actually, they walked to Sweden. That time, there was no water here because uh, the ice had shifted the land around. So they walked into Sweden from Denmark. And after that, nothing really happened for 5,000 years. <coughs> then something happened down there. Farming started in what is now eastern Turkey and Syria. Actually, uh, scientists have tested wheat, modern wheat, and seen that the ancestor of modern wheat seemed to have grown just outside the city of Diyarbakir in eastern Turkey. So you can test DNA of almost everything nowadays. Maybe that's the next talk. Wheat ancestry. <laughs> but then there's been a big debate over the last 50, 60 years. Some have said, okay, we were hunter-gatherers in Sweden, Scandinavia, and Northern Europe, and then we learned to farm. We started farming. And the other side has said, no, 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 no. We didn't learn to farm. There were new people coming who were farmers. They started to farm. And they took over. And this debate has been going back and forth, back and forth. And it has been impossible to settle this until DNA. And now it's really obvious that there were really new people coming. You can see that very clearly in Sweden in ancient DNA. First we have layers of people with ancient hunter-gatherer DNA, and then suddenly it turns over and we have farmer DNA from Syria, eastern Turkey. And then for many years scientists said, okay, we were hunter-gatherers and then we were farmers. That was all. But just a couple of years ago, as many of you know, we discovered another signal in the DNA of Europe. A population called, in a culture called Yamnaya, or Yamna, on the steppes north of the, of the Black Sea. They had cattle, they learned to, tame, they, to ride a horse, they had chariots, they had new weapons of bronze, and that made them very, very successful. So, 5,000 years ago, there was a huge migration from the east into Europe and up in Scandinavia. We can see that in Scandinavia today, that all the earlier Scandinavians, the hunter-gatherers and the farmers, they were almost wiped out. Over 80% of Scandinavians today come from this wave of migration. And if you take a DNA test today, and get I2, the right two, I think, or, yeah, or IM223, it might say in your result, then you have your roots back to the first hunter gatherers of Europe. If you get a G2A, then you're a farmer, or at least your ancestors were farmers. And if you get R1A, R1B, or I1, then you are a result of this migration during the early Bronze Age. And from all this, scientists have been working on this to, to uh, create a family tree of all the humanity. Many of you know this. And for the men, it looks like this. A lot of branches. And when I started testing, they found one new branch every third or fourth week. Nothing much happened. Nowadays, it's starting to look like this. We are finding 50 new branches a week. It's really exploding. That's thanks to all this, the genealogists in the world that are testing. The academics, they can't follow anymore. It's we, genealogists, that's, that's driving the development of the tree. And this means that if we have written records way back, and the DNA trees are starting to grow from backwards in time and forward, they are not connecting with the written sources. That makes it possible to, to do genealogy for thousands of years back. I think that's one of the most interesting aspects of, of this with DNA and written sources. 
And just to show how that can be used, I will talk a short bit about mitochondrial DNA. This is the line of mothers I have on my maternal line. That's my mother on the top and her great, 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 great grandmother, Brita Jonsdotter, who lived in mid Sweden in the 1650s. If you have done genealogy and you have your family tree mapped that far back, you're starting to, to wonder, okay, is this correct? There might be some faults here. There could be problems with the records. You can have uh, interpreted the records wrong, isn't it? Uh, then DNA is really great because in this case, I know it's correct. I have tested my mitochondrial DNA. I carry her mitochondrial DNA because it's carried down through my mother's. And we have tested a line from another, uh, another sister to my ancestors. So now I have confirmed those two lines 11 generations back in time. I know it's correct. And using mitochondria DNA. Many people look down on mitochondria DNA and think, ah, oh, that's nothing for genealogists. I think it's great if you have a case like this. Use it to confirm lines. It's very, very effective. And going even further back in time, I can see that the matches up there is my ancestor. And my matches are mainly down on the continent and very much on the British Isles. I think this could have been brought to Scandinavia by the Vikings, maybe. Or on the, uh, during the Iron Age. We don't know that yet. But one thing I know is that one of my most interesting ancestors, she showed up there, just outside Hamburg. Well, not just showed up, she was dug up. It's her. <laughs> <laughs> she has the exact same mitochondrial DNA as I and my mother. And she is 7,200 years old. Isn't that feeling? <laughs> <laughs> and she is said to be uh, in a museum in Hauderstadt, outside Hamburg. I have to go there, I haven't been there yet, but I have to go to visit her sometimes. I think that's also. And uh, one thing that shows that mitochondrial DNA is really interesting. It's not just Y DNA. And one more example of that is I have a friend who lives here. She tested her mitochondrial DNA and she got a haplogroup called C4A1C. And that's a very rare haplogroup. It turns out she's the only one in Europe with that haplogroup. And that, of course, starts you thinking, what? how can it be so unique? And she wonders, I'm just an ordinary person. How can I be, be this unique? So we started to do her genealogy on the maternal line. And we came back to the mid-1600s to a woman called Margareta Bjarnstotter. Then it, the record stops. We couldn't get any further. But still, she's unique in Europe. And how? We didn't know anything until uh, a year ago. Then there, there turned out there was a uh, research report from Russia where they had tested native populations in several parts of Russia. And they found lots of C4A1C in one place. Eastern Siberia. In that area, there's a people living called Ivanks. Isn't the clothing beautiful? <laughs> And they have lived there for thousands of years, and they are reindeer herders and hunters. And this shows that they have a concentration there, nowhere else in the world but here. So somehow, before the 1600s, a woman must have come from here 8,500 kilometers to mid-Sweden. This could have happened for, through many, many generations. You can have a couple hundred years movement, but then you're supposed to find someone in between with the same. Not everyone is tested, of course, but still. <coughs> so the theory we have right now is, you know, we have those people who went far away this way to America, and they were also here in Murmansk, and that was the Vikings. It's not that strange to think they could have gone a little bit further east and brought a woman back home. So probably the Vikings. There is one other theory 
That is the reindeers of the Sami people. They haven't been here forever. Uh, we have tested the reindeer's DNA, of course, <laughs> and found that the ancestor of the, of the, the reindeers in northern Scandinavia actually came there to Scandinavia just 1,500 years ago. And they came from here. So it could be also that this woman, she came along when they imported reindeer herding in Scandinavia. Lots of interesting questions popping up. We haven't solved this yet, but some, someday we will. Okay, let's go from mitochondrial DNA to Y DNA. This is my mother-in-law's brother, Roland Bergman. He tested a Y DNA 37 test four years ago. Many of you start out with a Y DNA 37. It's a good start. And he got quite a few matches. Some of them were Russian nobility. We started thinking, how could this be? We have all our ancestors in a tiny area in mid Sweden. And at that time, he had only two matches in Norway, one in Finland, and those two in Russia, Ukraine. And with so few matches, and at that time we didn't have even the new large Y DNA tests, couldn't do a big Y, didn't exist. So we couldn't. Well, we couldn't really figure out how could this be. But nowadays, it looks like this. So many people have tested, and all these have shown that they have the same mutation called L1302. That means we know that all these people have a common ancestor, because they have inherited that mutation from that man. We also know, because we have gotten all these people to do the big Y test, the extensive test from family tree DNA, then we can calculate the actual family tree. We can see how they are related. So we can reconstruct the family tree like this. And also, because they have done this extensive testing, we can put a timeline. And they're all the way back before the medieval times, before the Viking Age, and into the Iron Age. So we know that they have a common ancestor around the year, year 200. And also because we have so, have so many tested, we have been able to, this is behind the scenes, it looks like John showed us earlier. It's a lot of mutations, and it's branches, and it's really a nerd country, <laughs> as, as we call it. <laughs> we can't show this to our members. It's, it's, Oh, they don't understand it. So we have compiled a better tree. So this, I think, is one of the, the most comprehensive trees made from big Y testing in all the world today. We have a common ancestor, the H200. We have a lot of branches in northern Sweden, these blue ones, in Finland, mid Sweden. We have in southwestern Norway and in northern Norway. And we also have some branches branching off from Sweden, Norway. The year 700, the year 500, and going away to Ukraine and Russia. That's exactly what the history tells us. Because it was the Vikings who went over to, to Ukraine to found the, the Kievan Rus uh, nation back in the 800s. So, doing comprehensive Y DNA testing can really map against history. We can see that, okay, this, these are Vikings. These are probably Vikings also, but they haven't spread west. They have only spread east. But we also have, if you go like 15 generations further back, we have a man who had a mutation called L1301. There we have also 60 people do have, uh, which have done this big Y test. Let me get this pattern. Relatives of my, of my uh, mother-in-law's brother, they have gone east. But the relatives of this L1301 man, they are found here. Very clear pattern. So we can see that the Vikings that ended up in the British Isles, they came from Norway and southwestern Sweden. And the Vikings that ended up here in Russia and Ukraine, they came from the coast of East Sweden. So 
the more man that does extensive widening testing, we can really map out history like this. And we can, if I take more half groups than just this uh, L1301, we can see in more detail that it was Vikings from Denmark and southern Sweden, which were Denmark at that time, who came to England and Normandy, this part of the world, and it was Vikings from Norway, who ended up in Stockholm and in Ireland, and Vikings from the east coast of Sweden went that way. And as you know, the Vikings had quite a huge expanded territory in the 9th and, and 10th and 11th century, not just in Scandinavia and British Isles. They <coughs> had settlements down in the Mediterranean area. They often went this way down to get silver, which eventually ended up in Ireland and Scotland. And as you know, they were here, they founded a couple of your cities. And they also left something. They left, of course, coins, a lot of silver and coins here from the Vikings. But they also, in their ships, they carried cats. There was a recent study, just a couple of weeks ago. They have mapped the DNA. Of course, they had DNA tested cats. Why not? <laughs> so they have mapped the genomes of the cats back to Egypt. And they can see that the cats of the Mediterranean and Egypt are found in the Baltic Sea area. That is the Vikings. They have taken them through Eastern Europe over the rivers up in the Baltic Sea area. And this is also probably a result of Vikings. They're quite similar, aren't they? But that's a main coup in America. And this is a Norwegian forest cat in Norway. They're very similar, similar, even genetic. So that's probably due to the Vikings carrying cats between Scandinavia and the British Isles and then further on to America. So I, uh, last year you had a, someone speaking about mice and Vikings. So this, well, <laughs> I thought that, that's why they had the cats. <laughs> ah, yes, they had to, yes. <laughs> But let's look at human DNA. It's quite easy to see when we look at the DNA results that from Scandinavia to the British Isles, we have a huge flow of R1A and I1. I1 is also called IM253. And I've heard many people say that, well, we get the question that, ah, I have IM253, I'm a Viking. Oh, you, you cannot be sure of that. All M253 are not Vikings. I1 originated here 5,000 years ago in northern Germany. And many family lines went this way in the Bronze Age, or the Iron Age, so they don't have to be Vikings. But this is quite clear. This is the DNA flowing out of Scandinavia. We can also see that we have DNA flowing into Scandinavia during the Viking Age. That's R1b. If we look at the DNA results in Sweden, we have, as I said, we have 80% of the men belong to those three heifer groups. R1A, we can see very clearly that they all came in at the same time during the Bronze Age, and then they branched off in Sweden. I1, quite the same. They came in during the Bronze Age and spread out Sweden. But R1B, it's very tricky if you get R1B in Sweden, because you never get any matches. You can see that R1B has been trickling into Scandinavia one person at a time over many hundreds, maybe thousands of years. So that is the, the main pattern. Of course, in the reality, it doesn't look like that. It looks more like this. <laughs> so it's a bit tricky to, to find which one has gone in what direction. And what make it, makes it even more tricky is that during the Bronze Age, they also had boats. Quite good boats, actually. You can see many of them in, on the rock carvings in Scandinavia. And they went all over the North, North Sea. So, of course, they spread their DNA even at that time. But looking at the Viking Age spreading of DNA, it's actually possible to... I have gone through the, uh, the projects of the Irish Y-DNA, 
uh, the R1A project, the I1 project, etc. And actually, there are a couple of surnames in Ireland that's clearly Viking. R1A is the most obvious. That's probably from the first invasion. You had two Viking Ages in Ireland. So that's Norwegian, mostly. And this is I1. Could be Norwegian, or could be Danish, or could be Swedish. It's harder to tell. There are probably more, but these are, are clearly Viking, if I look in the projects. How do you know they're Viking? The Hapra group is, in the first case, it's clearly Scandinavian R1A. No, no doubt about it. And here they are clearly in Scandinavian I1. Do you know from the names or anything? No, not from the names. Just, I guess you can just uh, judge from their Y chromosomes. So they might have been coming from, from England or from Scotland, so I don't. But their origin is in Scandinavia. And if, if I, I went through those names and those people, they have mapped you their earliest known ancestor, they get this pattern. You see, it's a, a very big concentration in Northern Ireland. <coughs> and there's a huge overweight from Norway, Norwegian Vikings. That could be because very, very few Danes have tested. That's a problem. They have a lot, like a, a white spot on the map in Denmark. There's 20,000 people tested in Sweden. There's 8,000 tested in Norway. In Finland, it's 9,000. In Denmark, it's like 500. So the Danes should begin testing their Y chromosomes. They are the key to see exactly when and how uh, <coughs> YNA came into Scandinavia and over the British Isles. <coughs> so if any one of you is going to Denmark, take a kit with you. Yeah. <laughs> you actually have a national genome project which is very ambitious to test most of the population for health purposes. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the problem also that uh, in Denmark they are they're tested for health purposes, but they are very skeptical to do in genealogy. I'm not sure why. why. It's strange. So is it possible that the concentration in Northern Ireland came in from Scotland? This was the plantation here a few hundred years ago? Could be. Could be. I just looked at uh, these people in these places. They have clearly Scandinavian Y DNA. And they could have come via Scotland or via via Britain. A lot of the names could possibly have Norman associations, and especially in Northern Ireland, where you've got a lot of English names okay. with Norman um, that actually originated uh, in Normandy. Yeah, it could be Norman, Norman also. Uh, also, that's true. But I think that the Norway, the Norwegian Y chromosomes, I don't think they are Norman. Maybe the Danish one could have gone that way. But we need more tested in, in France also for that. Where is Jos? He's yeah. testing. He's testing. That's good. <laughs> so, Excuse me. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Regarding Normandy, was Rollo, who I think was a grandson of an original Viking invader into Normandy, was, was Rollo's parentage from Norway or Denmark? That's a good question. You're asking about Rollo, the Viking king in, in Normandy. Uh, he was of Viking descent, but we don't know his haplogroup group yet. He is DNA tested He's right now, as we speak, but they haven't published any results yet. And that's uh, actually, the, you, can, you can bet in, in Scandinavia money on if you will turn out to be Norwegian, Danish, or Swedish. People are really interested to know the results. But they've found uh, someone in Reading Abbey. I think I've had a follow-up question yeah. there. Just bring the microphone down so we can actually hear at the front. Thanks. Yes, apropos your map there, um, someone mentioned up front that uh, could these flags uh, come somehow from Normandy, yeah? With the Norman invasion through Britain or through Wales, South Wales, uh, which this original Norman invasion of Ireland was a kind of Welsh, Norman, Flemish, Admixture, as far as I know. Um, so uh, I just say, in case you don't know, th there is an area of concentration of these Norman names in Ireland. That's your southeastern corner down there. Yeah. Yeah, Wexford. And, uh, I don't know whether 
we can say there are Norman or Viking flags that you've got there, or Scottish uh, Viking flags uh, on your map. But just an observation, whether, whether you're aware of that. Yeah, definitely. We don't know if what way these people took to get here, but they originated in Norway, or in Sweden, Denmark, like this. Let's just ask you, what, what's your general definition of a Viking? Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the first one is, that the name Viking didn't exist. Uh, the Viking means, in, in Old Norse, a Viking was someone who, who uh, traveled on a Viking, he called him Viking. To go Viking meant to go away to raid and pray. So they didn't call themselves Vikings. Norsemen is better. And also the Vikings that went east, they're called Varangians. We shouldn't be talking about Vikings, but I mean, it's, it's stuck. People are talking about Vikings. And I'd say Vikings are the people that from Scandinavia, they went away to trade and, and raid uh, from the 750s to the 1050s. Well, that's my definition. So they are not any special kind of people, really. Cool. So, if you find out that you are, you can you can see that you clearly have a Scandinavian YD name. You are in Ireland. Then you can do like this. I looked at just one in, in County Mayo. Uh, chambers, I think. Yeah. yeah, Chambers. And if you have done an extensive YD test, so you know a SNP, a mutation that's happened fairly recently, then you can see what cluster you belong to. In this case, this Chambers has its matches here. That makes it quite clear that this must have been Norwegian Vikings, maybe coming through Scotland. You don't know that. This guy has, hasn't done the extensive DNA test yet. But when all these people have done the extensive big Y or similar tests, we can see in, in what order they branched out from each other. Then we can map their travels even better. But this is a clear case on the Norwegian Vikings. And um, I'm not going to go into the technical details of why DNA, we have heard that before. So I just, just leave you with this stuff. You have, you have clear traces in Ireland, exactly how they got here, we don't know yet. But the more people that test, we will know more, of course. So I leave the floor for, for questions. Oh, I can't show it. Oh, I, I'll show this first. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> I was thinking of, of ending with, I, I made a simple flow chart because it's tricky for you. And when we get the question also, okay, am I a Viking? You can use this flow chart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no. This is an assembly chart for, for a chair from a Swedish furniture company. <laughs> hold, hold on. This is better. If you're R1B, mm, probably not the Viking. We have one, some R1B lines that went to Scandinavia during the Bronze Age and Iron Age and then back to the British Isles, but very few. If you are I1, IM253, you may be a Viking, but you have to check your matches. If you are in a Scandinavian cluster, surrounded by only Scandinavians, then you're most probably a Viking descendant. If you are R1A, that's better, because then you're most probably a Viking paternal line. Most R1A in these areas are from Scandinavia. And if you are RC284, if you have that mutation, that's very, very Scandinavian, because that happened in Denmark and got descendants all over Scandinavia. So if you are R C284, then you're almost 100% Viking, I say. If you're YP355, mm -hmm. definitely Viking. <laughs> Thank you. The flowchart, the last slide. Thanks, Peter. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, 
L1301 and L1302, what percentage of the uh, Swedish population or Scandinavian population are L1301 and L1302? Uh, in Sweden, L1301 is about 5%. And L1302, that's extreme. That man, he lived, I think this is really amazing. We have a man living in the year 200 who turns out to be father of very many men in Sweden, in northern Sweden, in northern part of Sweden. He's the father of, well, every third man. So 33%? 33%. Wow. That's extreme. Wow. And, and this coincides with the explosion of iron in mid-Sweden, in the Roman Iron Age. We have a, a huge expansion of, and we can see in the archaeological site, that this time, around the year 200, 300, the wealth is, is uh, uh, growing a lot in mid-Sweden. And iron from mid-Sweden is exported around all of Scandinavia. So probably he was very successful with the iron. Father. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please forgive the audience. <laughs> Great. Well, um, questions then. We have lots of questions, I'm sure. I'm going to go to this lady here first. Hi. My question is um, my mother's people are calling. I'm going to yeah. ask you to come over here away from the speaker, right. otherwise, okay. we're going to get horrible feedback in the press. My mother's people are called Dobson, which is a, a, a Viking name. But as well as that, um, I have a thing called Duchenne Contracture, which the medical, medical books say came from the Vikings. Is there any way of, of tracking the, the, through, the, through, through um, DNA, the, the actual Duchenne Contracture? Would that add to the data? Would that add to the likelihood of being able to trace it? Well, the the pro problem with with diseases and, and the traits is that, that they can travel almost any way, any way through your uh, family tree, not just the paternal or the maternal line. Right. So, but uh, mm -hmm. you should, have you tested your maternal line, your mitochondria? I haven't, no, as yet I haven't, but I'm, I have cousins with the same uh, Duchenne contracture. So okay. it's, it's yeah. there in the family, and the medical books all say, okay, from the Vikings. Uh, it's hard to know, but <laughs> the only thing that only DNA that goes so far back is mitochondrial DNA right. and Y DNA. So if you have a brother, right. test him right. Y DNA, and you test your mitochondria to see if you right. maybe yeah. have yeah. a Viking DNA. Thank you. We have to explain to Peter that the Vikings get blamed for an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, just a brief comment on, on that question. For yesterday, Professor Bradley was talking about phenotypes, and uh, particularly in the Irish population, like lactose, lactose tolerance or hemochromatosis, uh, you know, iron deficiency, and um, many, many different uh, phenotypes can be traced through the academic uh, DNA studies. I'm not sure. Uh, that, that all the direct consumer ones will do it. Certainly not FTDNA, perhaps 23 may. You know, perhaps, but yeah. they are using approximately the same chip. Yeah. They, they have, family tree avoids, avoids every gene that could be medical. medical, medical yeah. 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 So, so, so my question was, there was a, some major studies done in Iceland, and they found that 60% of the MTDNA came from Ireland, Scotland, or Celtic, generally Celtic uh, lands, and 70% uh, of the Y came from Vikings, right? This was uh, Iceland. I'm wondering, are you finding, and they, they say this is by carrying back people from the raids back to um, Iceland. Have you found anything similar? In yeah. We think that this pattern comes from with all the R1B coming back to Scandinavia, much of that, I think, they brought slaves back, they married here, and they came back, and they also imported civil servants to Denmark when they, the Christianity came into Sweden. So, much of this, I think, it's with the Vikings bringing back people. And were there many Viking women that came over from Norway, or was it many men? I haven't, haven't looked that much. Mitochondria DNA is it's trickier to work with, and there are fewer women who are tested yet. But we will be looking into that as more women are testing. And or, or men are testing. You also carry a DNA. Yeah. 
Peter's 5,000 members in his Swedish DNA project, so he's um, a, a, an exemplary, uh, well, he's an example to all of us to try and get as many people tested as possible. Question. I have actually two questions. My first question is this. Um, I'm very interested in Northern Ireland history, and um, in the 1600s, uh, the British were very anxious to get rid of a lot of people uh, who were creating trouble for them. And uh, there was a very sad situation where 600 of them were put on a boat and sent to uh, uh, Norway. <coughs> or Sweden, Sweden, sorry, Sweden. And there's great interest by a lot of people in Ireland in trying to trace some of these people. So you might be interested uh, in following that up. Uh, I haven't just got all the details in my mind just now, but I believe it was in the 1600s. That's very, very interesting. I would like to know more about that. Yes. That could explain some of the R1B appearing in the Western Sweden. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Now, we, no, we don't have, well, we would have some names for them because it's recorded in history, but uh, we wouldn't have names for the general, the general lot, but uh, maybe some of the top people who were aggravating the British at the time. Yeah. Uh, so I will look up what I can find and uh, make that available to you. Please do. Now, the second point that I was going to make uh, was uh, just give me a moment now because I've got so my mind has gone right into this one and I almost forget the other one. So I just leave that one for a bit. Patrick, and then we'll come back to you. It's very brief. First of all, marvelously entertaining and very informative. But if we if there's no such thing as a Viking, is there a Viking? <laughs> the Y and the B. Uh, how do you reconcile it? Thank you. I'd say there's a Y a Y king. There are actually for when it comes to Sweden there are three Y kings. Or Scandinavia. <clears throat> ah so many. Yes. There we go. I say it's, there are three. Uh, when this invasion came from the east, there was R1A and R1B. And R1A and R1B is 40% of the population in Sweden today. They were founded by two men, probably somewhere here, 5,000 years ago. Those two men have started 40% of Sweden's population. And then we had another man here in northern Germany who was I1 at the same time. He has fathered 40% himself. So these three men <laughs> populated 80% of Sweden. And this man, R1B, populated 90% of Ireland. Mm -hmm. He was very productive. Is he Viking or, or Viking? I think he's a white king. Why? Yeah. White king. <laughs> I, I remember what I was going to talk about now. I come from the, in Ireland. I come up to that right little point at the top uh, of Ireland, just jutting up there. <coughs> We're just going through Siberia sure. to get there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we have one. Uh, uh, yes, you see, or the northern Yela up there, there's a bit, uh, there's rough oil and then there's rough swimming. You see the little land at the top. Oh, no, no. Yes, we are putting it right. Yes. But right, right up there, there's a old castle called Karagabrahi Castle. And uh, it's still standing but only, and it's been sort of fortified in the last couple of years. But uh, some of my relatives, my grand aunt was married to a man called Pat McFall, <coughs> and the McFalls were living in the time of the Vikings, and one of them married a, a, a Viking lady, and they had a child called Citric McFall, and that is in the very, very early ages. So there you are, that's a link between that part of Northern Ireland, and you can see where they would have come in, yeah. and, uh, and in McFalls. And uh, that family of McFalls is still in existence in this parish. Interesting, yeah. How many beards did he have? <laughs> How many G have the group in Sweden? That would have been the... Um, Early farmers in Sweden. Early farmers. There's uh, only a two and three percent left. So they were really supplanted by yeah. the Orwin B, Orwin A, 
But I won did quite survive quite a lot. The the I won, yes, that was the front stage. Yeah. No, no, I, that's I two. I two really. Yeah. yeah. No, I two is on uh, two and a half percent. Oh really? Yeah. We have looked through all the five thousand people in Sweden, the, the tested people, and also in Norway and, and Finland. <coughs> we, we can't find one living man now with I two and G two A that descends directly from the first farmers or the hunter gatherers. They have come in later. So they are all extinct. Wow. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. We have a question here. Well, I was going to, I was going to ask what is the help group for the descendants of the hunter gatherers? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's I two. I two. Or I M two two three. Okay, thank you. How many I twos in the audience? We have one at the back. Okay, both women. Um, I, I have I two ancestors in the middle of my tree, but I'm Orwin B myself. Orwin A, how many Orwin A in the audience? Oh, okay, we've got a Viking here. Yeah, right. Very good. Okay. Question from Jim Holler. Here we go. It almost would look like the Viking influence would have taken over all of Europe, you know, all the places they were. What, uh, what was the, the approximate population during the heyday? Uh, you know, 850 to 1,000. Uh, in Europe or in? Well, I mean, you know, among the uh, the Scandinavian area, did they have? Uh, do you have a population estimate of? No, they, they certainly went everywhere. And yeah, they went there, but they weren't so many. I think they were not a million, maybe half a million. But still, they were very effective to to really cover large areas. We have a question from this lady over here. Uh, okay, maybe like uh, I was going to say about Scandinavians who came uh, uh, from Denmark to Normandy and then 1066. Um, they have a relative who was standard bearers back in Hastings. There was two son, two son of Gros, I think, and then they came down to the Fitzsimons. But they hadn't got their surname fixed at that stage. But um, I was just saying about them, like. Uh, uh, um, is that included the, the, the kind of those who came at 1066 uh, in your DNA? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Project. You know. If if they came from Denmark and have a Scandinavian Hapra <coughs> group and went this way and then up, then they are included. But they might be have been Vikings that lived in southern Denmark and they don't have a clearly Scandinavian DNA. So it's hard to tell. But if they have a uh, R1A, there's no doubt they are from here. Right. Okay, thanks. And it's it's really quite strange because who was the ruler of England when the, when uh, William the Conqueror came? It was a Dane, Knut the Dane. He he became king of England exactly now a uh, thousand years ago, 1016. So they had a Danish king, and then the Danish descendants from Normandy came and took over England from him. Just a quick question on your three waves. Could you go back to that one? Yeah. We'll wear this out. We're <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> closing up there. Yeah, I suspect we're, we're going to find a fort component, right? Which is this CHG. Could, yeah, it could be a part right. of this component also. No, coming from the south. Coming from the south. South Caucasus. No. No. South yeah. Caucasus. Like this, yeah. Feeding into. Yeah, and, and that's the latest presentation of Max Planck. They're saying that actually it'll be a hybrid model, a, a, a mix of the uh, the Bronze Age and the Neolithic. Yes, uh, this Yamnaya culture. That's Yamnaya. Yeah, the it was a, a composite of, of this one and also from the Alpine Mountains over here. Yes. yes. So of course these people have, have mixed from every. That's. That's really clear when you look into that DNA. We have now, I've written a book, as Maurice said, called The Father in Sweden, over the last 11,000 years. We have looked into the wide DNA of archaeological findings, and we have looked into, looked into the DNA of, of living people. And when it comes to the Sami people, it's always been a controversy. Those are the Finnish. The Finnish, uh, not the Eskimo. Finnish, the Sami. Eskimo. No. No. no, they were called the Laps. The best indigenous people in Sweden. Yeah, uh, has always been a debate. We have been there for 10,000 years. You have come recently. You have come from this way, this way, this way, this way. 
Um, I can't show all my books, but now when we have looked into those deep DNA testing, why DNA tests, it's very, very, very clear when they came, where they came from, we also know where, where the ranges come from. So <laughs> DNA testing can really solve all these disputes. What's the short answer? No, that 10 years. Buy the book. I don't know, buy two books. You have to buy a book in Swedish also. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one, one very simple question. How the hell did you get so many people to do their Y-DNA? Because that, that's mind-blowing for any of us in any of the other areas. Yeah. Like this big one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. talking about twenty thousand people. That's just phenomenal. Yeah, that's uh, the people have put into our, our projects like sixty, seventy thousand dollars, more than that, one hundred thousand dollars soon. So that's a lot of money. Uh, we have a very active project group. We have uh, project administrators in in Moscow, in Sweden, in Norway, and in Finland, and we work together and we contact every batch. We show them trees like this. You want to be in the tree? <laughs> <laughs> and every every time family tree has a discount. Every time family tree has a discount, we go out with the mail to all our members. Now is the time to test. And we have members that have tested and say, "Okay, can I do something more? Can I test at full genomes?" Mm, no, it's better to donate to two people, to our members, half the price of the big Y, and then we get people to test. So. So every discount we get 10 to 30 new testers. Why not success in Denmark? That's a good question. Denmark is very, very, very slow in DNA testing. I have tried to, I'm traveling all around Sweden and uh, giving presentations. There's huge interest. I always have kids with me. I, I swap maybe 20, 25 people after each presentation. But Denmark, we can't even go in there. They don't want us. I'm not sure why. It's really? probably because they donate more sperm than anybody else. That's true. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's the reason. Yeah. And they're scared. They're Denmark, scared. Is, Denmark is world leaders in sperm donation. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, actually. Um, question here from Debbie. Very, very good point. Do you think that we'd get away with mitochondrial DNA only in Denmark? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Um, just a quick question about oops, ancient DNA. Because I understand that you That's a very interesting question. As you say, we have Sweden has been quite slow, not as slow as Spain, but quite slow when it comes to testing skeletons. They have tested eight, I think, up until now. But now they have gotten money from uh, funding at uh, Stockholm University, <coughs> at Charlotte University, first to test 100 skeletons. But now, just a couple of weeks ago, they got more money to test 1,000 skeletons. That will be a huge database called the Swedish Atlas, DNA Atlas. And that will be a, a really gold mine for us when you do in genealogy. But, as you say, it could turn over a lot of thoughts about how Sweden looked like for 2,000 years ago. And of course, I'm, ha I'm hoping that we have in uh, exactly in the middle of Sweden, quite close to where I live, there is a huge grave from the Iron Age, in Högon, it's called, and uh, many of those Mounds are, of course, plundered and looted. But this one was intact, and it was magnificent. It was a, a chamber in there with a man lying with very large swords and a lot of 
the clothing was almost intact. He had servants buried with him. Really, a great grave. And I hope he is going to be tested now. I hope he will turn out to be El Tardinucci. <laughs> 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 Two quick questions. The Picts. What is the relationship between the Picts and Swedish or Scandinavian DNA? I haven't looked into that. Okay. I haven't studied Scotland, so... And what's your feeling about the Normans, and particularly the Canberra Normans who came into Ireland? Do you, what do you think their relationship with Scandinavian DNA is? A feeling for Normans is frustration. <laughs> they have tested a lot of people now in Normandy. But the result, they display was just, okay, I have so many percent that I won, R1B, R1A, period. Not a single detail on what branch of I1 or R1A, so it doesn't say anything. Is there going to be more uh, publications about that particular study? I, I asked Joss yesterday and he didn't know. So the French so are a bit... We do need that um, uh, level of detail to try and tie it in with the fantastic work that you've done. Yeah. So, um, uh, we have to draw this second day of Genetic Genealogy Ireland to a close, unfortunately. We could talk for another 10 or 15 minutes, I'm sure, at least. But uh, what, a, what a wonderful high point to end the second day of the conference on. Please, can you give a warm round of applause to the students? We'll be back tomorrow at 11.10 uh, with uh, the first of our uh, speech uh, presentations. So, uh, safe home and uh, see you tomorrow. It's fantastic, Peter. It's really, really interesting. Well done. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to shoot off and have um, some business with you at the time the airport. But are you free tomorrow? tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Off tomorrow. That's, well, that's your free oh, yeah. test. I have your free test yeah. as well. Oh. Oh. Uh, well, I will have tomorrow. That, You're around yeah. tomorrow? I'm here tomorrow. Grand, is, okay. that, is that the Y test? Uh, any t it is Y37 or it is a um, family finder or it is a mitochondrial DNA plus. Um,